I'm the director of MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Los Angeles. The exhibition Elter Skelter was such uh, uh, a storm when it comes to art history. My colleagues, most of my peers, discover, discover Los Angeles art, uh, Los Angeles artists through the gaze of, uh, of this exhibition. The significance of Elter Skelter uh, exploded in the art community face. Mike Kelly, of course, many other artists, many other of Mike's friends were there, but that's where, in a way, through Elter Skelter, the equilibrium of the American art scene changed. New York was a place where we thought, from Europe, uh, everything was happening. Then we realized, oh, there is a there is an alternative. It was not only an alternative to New York, it was an alternative way of working, an altern alternative way to look at art. The reason why MOCA at the time could be an echo chamber for these voices is that someone like Paul Schimmel had his nose on the ground, he was listening to artists, and therefore he was able to create a program that was about experimentation. You look back, you know, 20 years later, and, and you realize how important it was. What needs to happen to a museum such as MOCA right now is to continue this tradition. We need to be a courageous institution. It was courageous in 92 when Elter Skelter was invented, was curated. The situation, the, 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 the geopolitics of the art world are extremely different now. We cannot say that Los Angeles is a new center. Uh, it's not the way it works, but through the voices of artists like Mike Haley uh, and others, you know, Ed Rushy, Paul McCarthy, uh, early on someone like Barbara Smith, they represent now a totally different, uh, again, a totally different view on uh, American art. The art scene, the art community in, in Los Angeles is articulated around the voices of artists. And that's, for me, what makes a difference in Los Angeles, is the voice of the artist. That's also why, for me, MOCA, and the fact that Mike Kelly was at MOCA was so important. Mike was in the very first exhibition that uh, MOCA organized, the very first one, 35 years ago. Unfortunately, Mike Kelly is no more with us, but to see that now this exhibition honor, acknowledge the importance of his artist, for the art community really makes MOCA uh, the artist museum. So through the voice of Mike, and that's what also what, what was extremely moving for me, coming to MOCA at this moment, opening this exhibition, you know, within a week of my new position, was to see these waves of artists, uh, artists uh, for whom I have tons of respect, uh, coming and paying tribute to an artist whom they love. There won't be a new Elter Skelter. There won't be another Mike Kelly. These voices are too singular to be repeated. But having this exhibition as the first exhibition under my directorship was a way for me to set the bar aesthetically uh, at a place where uh, I can, we can really start working, making the museum a very experimental museum, because that was, my Kelly was about experimentation. I am uh, Paul Schimmel, partner and vice president of Hauser, Wirth and Schimmel here in Los Angeles, and I have been the uh, chief curator of MOCA for uh, 22 years, and uh, a friend of Mike Kelly's and had begun working with him uh, back in 1982 and uh, was the uh, chairman of the board of the Mike Kelly Foundation until recently.
the first time I saw Mike at this party, I, I, all of a sudden you realize, just looking at him, that this was not uh, your old Los Angeles artist. He had long, sort of stringy black hair, kind of a little on the sort of greasy side. He had a leather jacket and black pants, and you just sort of realize, oh, this is this is a this is a whole new generation. There was nothing um, uh, false or or manipulated in terms of uh, how he presented himself. This is how he had been since he'd been growing up in Detroit and, uh, and in fact had come out of kind of the, the underground or the, maybe the last notion of an underground and the punk rock sort of scene. When I came to MOCA um, in 1989, uh, that among the very first things I wanted to do was a very speculative exhibition uh, about Los Angeles art in the 1990s. I thought, oh, now everyone's going to get so pissed off because, uh, you know, here it is, like 1992, and I'm going to say, okay, here it is. This, is. this is Los Angeles art. And from the get-go, there were uh, a handful of artists who were absolutely sort of central to the thinking of that exhibition. Um, and uh, Mike was... Uh, not only among the very first asked to participate, uh, but he, like some other artists, really helped uh, me to think about inclusions of other artists. For Helter Skelter, Mike had suggested that we bring together a group of drawings called the Garbage Drawings. Uh, these were works uh, that both uh, represented bags of garbage and they were a little bit like garbage in that he would send them to all of his dealers to sell at various fairs and places around the world. And it was like, you know, well, we could get some from here and some from there, but it wasn't really working for me. And he said, well, there's this unfinished piece that's never going to happen. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, Jay Shiat, and he's, you know, working with Frank Gehry, and they've asked me to make a commission, and, you know, they wanted, you know, to give me this big wall, but, you know, I'm not like a big wall sort of guy, and instead, I really gave him something great, and it had nothing to do with, in a way, Frank and his architecture. It had to do with the inner workings of the Shiat uh, uh, advertising agency. And I said, so, like, what is it? And, in fact, he had spent a long time working on plans to do a commission uh, that would take place in a suite of uh, offices that were, in a sense, in the core of the building. He thought it was just an incredible gift that these rooms, which had no kind of distinctive quality, sort of the back of the house inner core should then become kind of the centerpiece for, in a way, a, a work that's about as political and sort of agitprop, you know, as uh, uh, anything uh, Mike had done. And he had found some of these, these jokes that were in the workrooms. In fact, he had first seen these jokes back at CalArts. And I think that must have really interested them in all of this sort of highfalutin, theory-oriented, Cal Arts intellectuals. You know, you have these, you know, these like sort of really dumb, offensive, inappropriate workers' jokes sort of pinned to the wall of where the garbage is taken out. And he started collecting these things, and he decided, okay, these should become the murals that uh, 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 decorate all of these, these core workers' offices. But the real gift, the thing that just kind of blew his mind from a kind of like, oh, if, if, it, if, he, if it hadn't been there, he never would have conceived of it, but it was the, in some ways the best thing about it. The boardroom and the room that would be used for uh, the fax machines and the mail office, the mail, the mail room, were in fact budding each other. And he thought, let's put glass between these two rooms. 
And that way, whoever is in the boardroom can see what's going on in, in the mail room, and the mail room can see what's going on in the boardroom. Complete transparency. He took a kind of Dan Graham architectural idea, and he made it a kind of social uh, uh, a statement. And that quality of um, kind of taking art and sort of turning it around for a political purpose and a real embrace of the working class, the blue collar, uh, as I think he used to call it, the shitty end of the stick, uh, is something that was, um, I think, always a part of, of Mike. It became a bigger deal. By the time the show opened, uh, all of us were aware that this thing is just sort of kind of mushrooming in interest. And Mike very much wanted it to have as close to the qualities of the fit and finish of the, of the Frank Gehry Design J. Shiat office, which we uh, could not afford. <laughs> and that did become a, an area of some uh, stress uh, right into the uh, opening uh, uh, day, meaning there are expensive doorknobs and there are cheap doorknobs. There are, there are you know, uh, uh, custom lamps and not custom lamps. And he was very, in a way, flexible, but it had to look convincing. I remember kind of wandering in, and people had been working right up to the last minute with Ed Ruscha, uh down the staircase, and, and Mike comes out and he has a, a doorknob in his hand, and he's like holding it like some terrorist, and he starts screaming at me from eh, about 50 feet away. Ed goes, well, I'll see you later. <laughs> and he comes up and he goes, God, Damn it, I thought we had to do that. And he was absolutely right and furious because the illusion was important. It had to have that sort of sense of it being uh, an office space dropped into the uh, museum. It certainly was uh, among the most significant works in the show, not only because of what it did and how it did it, it also took an artist who was still relatively young, people had kind of one sense of who he, who he was, and this was among the most uh, complex and monumental installations he had done uh, to date. And it had a very, um, I think, strong uh, reverberation into both making Mike known much broader, but also even within the community of artists, Mike became more, in a way, complex and uh, nuanced and, uh, and in a sense, broader for them too. I'm Emma Reeves. I'm the creative director of Mocha TV, which is the, a YouTube channel for the museum in, uh, in Los Angeles, Mocha. One of the big important things is that Mocha reflects, you know, artists, the relationships that we have um, through the permanent collection, through the ongoing curatorial sort of programming at the museum. But we also look beyond and we make uh, what we could call news stories, you know, local based news stories. And this particular um, uh, uh, project is with an artist called Fritz Haig in association with a fantastic non-profit here in Los Angeles called Land, Los Angeles Nomadic Division. Ritz was telling me about this project called Wild Flowering LA, which is this really wonderful concept where, where they partnered with the Theodore Payne Foundation, which is here in Los Angeles. They're focused on indigenous or native plants. A hundred years ago, Theodore Payne collected local seeds of plants that were indigenous. And you can go to this wonderful um, place, a nursery, where you buy plants which are essentially natives. In association with the foundation, uh, Fritz got packets of seeds which he planted in, I think, 50, 50 sites across Los Angeles. We started following it way back, and then six months later it comes to fruition, and then there's a gathering of the seeds. So this is wonderful cyclical thing. My name is Fritz Haig. I'm an artist who lives in Los Angeles. And for the last 10 years, I've been doing a series of very small domestic edible gardens in cities around the world. I've now chosen to spend more time in Los Angeles at home and do more projects connected to my life and environment here, which leads me to wildflowering LA. So we've selected 50 sites stretching all the way from Topanga 
on the far western side to Pomona and the eastern side, all the way north to Lancaster, which is really wildflower country, all the way south to Palos Verdes. The sites range from public botanic gardens to public parks to people's front lawns, elementary schools, places of business. And at each site, we're placing a very big carved wood sign that identifies the site. It looks like a state park sign. It looks very official and it's been inspired by that. The idea being that we're introducing some of that way of looking at the landscape and understanding the landscape from the state park into the city. The seeds get planted now in November. They'll be growing through the winter very slowly because it's cool and there's not much light. In about April or May, we'll be getting flowers you'll be able to get a map and drive around the county looking at all these sites. We're at the Los Angeles County Arboretum and Botanic Gardens, which hosts the biggest uh, wildflowering LA site. It's almost one acre. And it's also the site that is um, the most public. So there's a constant stream of uh, public visitors to the Arboretum that are able to see what the kind of native landscape of Southern California and Los Angeles in particular looked like before it was urbanized. When we started uh, in fall 2013, this was a flat lawn, which was removed and then we moved the dirt around, we brought in dead logs, we created these mounds, this kind of topography on the site, and then created these swales so that rainwater would be captured and moved through the site and kept on the site as much as possible. One of the most exciting things that we've been seeing on all of these sites across the county is the immediate arrival of wildlife, especially pollinators. So we've been seeing a lot of different species of native bees, uh, birds that really are enjoying the seeds. And part of the pleasure of the project has been watching the slow progress happen across the county as the seeds germinate um, and as they slowly grow through the, the cool um, temperatures in the winter. And then around now in May, um, we have this explosion of uh, color across the county for those sites that have been really performing. At each site we've been hearing stories about, you know, not just the animals and their reactions, but the people and how they've responded. Because I think, you know, at certain points in the cycle, this can look like kind of chaotic to people who might be more used to viewing a hyper manicured landscape that always looked the same. So there's a story here that's very seasonal, that's very connected to our annual story here in Los Angeles, which is part of the goal of the project, paying attention to where we live, paying attention to the story of Los Angeles, which is very particular and extreme here. My name is John Knuth and uh, I'm a LA artist. Um, the video we did with Mocha TV was a video about my fly paintings where I raised hundreds of thousands of flies to make paintings for me. I've got a real interest in science and biology. You know, I, I grew up like catching snakes and looking at Andy Warhol books. I was originally interested in how flies ate and their biology and how they spread disease. So when flies eat, they're in a constant state of regurgitation. They vomit an enzyme onto a solid, like a cheeseburger, and that enzyme partially digests that solid and then they'll suck it back up. They'll regurgitate, suck it back in, regurgitate, suck it back in. And each of the little spots on the painting is actually called a fly speck. I see them everywhere now. Once you know what you're looking for, you'll see fly specks everywhere. I see them often on kitchen windows. And so what I'm doing is I'm just condensing hundreds of thousands of flies to land on the surface of the painting, and I'm changing their diet to paint, to pigment. So I can get very specific colors, very specific compositions with these things. The series of paintings I produced for the Mocha TV video was called um, Made in Los Angeles, and all the color palettes were based on L.A. sky colors. The painted backgrounds of the canvases were a lot of blacks, dusty blues, bright blues, kind of L.A. sky colors, smoggy blues. And then the paint I was feeding the flies was a lot of... Uh, sunset colors, so a lot of yellows and reds and blacks. I like this idea that the paintings become a metaphor for Los Angeles. The sprawl and the buildup of the paintings, I like that the compositions to me are sort of flying over the San Gabriel Mountains and seeing the LA Basin spread below you. You see this infinite sprawl, you know, you see this infinite sprawl of Los Angeles. 
there's like nothing worse than a fly. A fly is the worst animal. But what I really love about these paintings is you can take something that's totally base and makes, make something really transcendent with it. And I love that it all stems from this nasty thing. Here in Los Angeles, there's this huge industry around independent video games. And it's something that I noticed and started thinking of, we should do something about this. So we created this series called The Art in Video Games. We just celebrated different aspects of the indie video game community from Indiecade, which is an annual gathering, through to academics at UCLA, USC, these visionary people who are kind of 
doing this sort of blue sky thinking about what video games can can really be. There's a great energy around it. It's a great community. Um, it's obviously very different to the kind of first person shooter or the big you know war games, if you like. These are so lyrical and beautiful and just sort of wander through landscapes. There's one called Cloud and there's one called Journey. This particular episode focuses on the get that game company, which which was behind the production of these two games at the time. Nine years ago, I taught a class in game studies, and Genova Chen was in it, Kelly Santiago was in it, some, a bunch of really amazing people. And, and I basically said to them at that time, if we design games from our souls, from our hearts, that are utterly different than the games that are out there today, we can change the world. We, that game company, have a very unique approach of making games. We always start from an emotion, which is very different. Most people start with, hey, a genre. Hey, let's make a racing game. And we just thought it's really good to uh, do a company which can help explore the width of the medium and also increase the depth of the medium. I met Genova Chen at the USC Interactive Media Program. Going into our last year, he had been working on this student project called Cloud and asked me to come help finish producing the project. And at that time, I was just looking to do as many game projects as possible because I just knew that that's what I wanted to be doing. And so I immediately said yes. The Cloud game, my, my inspiration coming from just walking from the dorm to the school and looking up in the sky and thinking, how beautiful the sky is. Is there any way I can turn that into a game? In order to make it different, uh, we wanted to avoid the traditional trope of what video games are. So there isn't any violence in the game. There isn't any points or scores or level ups uh, that you play a typical game for. As we were working together on this project, uh, it became more and more apparent that Genova and I really shared similar ideas around making games that open up, um, that act as invitations to anyone, right? That say, yes, anyone can engage with a video game. Video games can be about anything, but that also means that they can appeal to anyone. We started getting hundreds of emails uh, telling us how the game made them very emotional, how we should really consider making more of these games to show the public that games aren't about just fighting and competing. And what really strikes me was one email was saying that you should tell the team who's involved in this that you're beautiful people. And I grew up my entire life, nobody told that I'm a beautiful person. So that's really special for me that I thought, well, geez, I've made like 12 games before this one. What's so special about this one that people are just going crazy? And then I had an enlightenment, which is the game creates a new type of emotion that typically you don't feel from games. And we thought we can push the boundary of what video game can communicate and create emotions that even adults uh, you know, will find it relevant and satisfying. I learned from Cloud that you know, if you create an innovation on the emotion, a lot of people who doesn't play a game will all of a sudden want to try a game. All my games are experiments, uh, from cloud to flow to flower and now journey. And I think that, that the concept you know, is what I was putting into it. And that concept is spreading around the world. Those folks went on and, pr and, and they did it, right? They, they did go on and they um, created those models. You know, games that are about the human condition, games that are, um, you know, provide in utterly new models of play. I feel very blessed that, you know, I worked on something that it's recognized and I felt understood. And I think that's the biggest reward an artist can ever get, you know, is somewhere, there's somewhere in the world and they heard your voice and they say, yes, I appreciate that, you know, and I don't need anything else, really. I'm Catherine Arias. I'm the Director of Education and Visitor Experience at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. We have a couple of programs that really focus specifically on youth. The first is a really long-standing 
school and teacher program called Contemporary Art Start. And that's that program has been in existence as long as MOCA has. And like MOCA, it's very experimental in terms of constantly evolving. Um, it's meeting the new challenges of contemporary art. It's meeting the challenges of the educational system. Not only do we tour the students who, whose classes are participating in that, but we work with the teachers in really inspiring professional development settings. So we work with teachers to um, develop strategies to look at images, you know, how can I talk about, about a, an image as a work of art in my classroom, and how do I get my students to talk about it? Because the more they talk about it, the more they hear each other, the more they come up with ideas they didn't necessarily think about. Um, and it can be a really, really rich way of teaching. The program that's in this video is the MOCA and Louis Vuitton Young Arts program. It's a life-changing program where the students actually apply. They are selected from a, a fairly large group and they become museum staff members for an academic year. They learn about the museum not from kind of reading about it in a textbook or kind of observing. They learn about the museum by actually doing the work of the museum. Another really important element of that program is the project that they do with a professional artist. This past year, they worked alongside Marnie Weber. Marnie's an LA-based artist whose work um, is pretty well represented in MOCA's collection, and she works in a, in a variety of media. She started off in performance, but then she does these kind of sculptural costumes, which evolve into films, and then she'll do collage and painting and photography. She's got a very multimedia practice. In fact, in the video, um, the whole atmospheric soundtrack is actually by Marnie. She devised a project for this for the teens that was really, really amazing because what she did was she had them focus on who they are. She created this project called Spirit Vessels, where you create a sculpture that expresses either a light or a dark side of your own identity. But what you see in the video is the making of the spirit vessels. And you gradually see them work at these really amazing sculptures.
WIFE is a Los Angeles-based collective which um, specializes in sort of choreographed performances using video projections. Mocha TV collaborated with them on, their, on, their, on a recent film uh, which is uh, called Passengers and it's directed by Benji Russell. This video reflects um, really feels very Los Angeles to me you know there's locations you can see there's multiple different types of locations there's a kind of spirituality to it you see them in the desert you see them in in I think it was Malibu they shot in and 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 it's a very simple thing you know a lot of it is very sculptural they're holding up reflective surfaces and bouncing light off them and it's just this sort of mesmerizing wonderful film evaporation as we leave a trail of stars in our wake. In this beginning, there was no space. Only you and we. Matter and antimatter falling endlessly in love. We were neon when there wasn't. We are the ancestors of religion. Existing where there is no language. We are inhabited by entire universes, just as we inhabit this space. 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 We birth light, energy, and matter. The first sensual creation we gave to you. The rest we gave to everything else. We have never needed nor wanted until we were given you. You were everything. And we were no longer alone.
now the cord has been severed and we float in this space, drifting in a state of emptiness, poured from one container into the next. Like a moth leaving its chrysalis, we can never go back. That is the only constant. We are the passengers, not the vessel. We are forever. My name is Elena Preciado, and I'm a curatorial assistant slash research assistant at MOCA. And I work with Alma Ruiz. She was a curator of Gas Giant, the Jacob Hashimoto show at the PDC. Jacob Hashimoto's practice uh, has a lot to do with landscape. He considers himself a painter, even though he doesn't work necessarily with what we would consider traditional painting. Even though he uses 3D objects, the way that he um, composes the space is very painterly-like. The story goes that he actually had a, a sort of like writer's block or artist block when he was in school, and he asked his father for advice, and his father uh, told him to start making kites just to relax. So he started making kites to relax. Doing that, he realized that he could actually use uh, the structures on, on a different take of paint on painting. What's well, a very intricate technique. He actually did a very profound research work going to China, to Thailand, to Japan. He tries to find the perfect kind of paper that would do what he wants, that would not bend. He uses a lot of bamboo, but also like different types of wood and plastic. So it's very experimental, but also very research-based. A lot of it he makes himself, um, and also he has a, a studio with a lot of assistants that help him um, build all these elements. When he has to mass produce, he also commissions um, a shop in China that is specializes in, in handcrafted kites to build like the first stage of the, of the kite. Then he receives them and then they start doing the collages and all of the, of the next steps. It has a feel of a ritual almost. It's a, it's a ritual that is very process-based and time-based to bring people together for you know spirituality or whatnot, but also have an element of nostalgia and optimism. They remind you of something familiar, like a kite. They remind you of childhood. It's a ritual that has to do with that. And it's very much tied to, to the idea of landscape and process and everything that is connected to his practice.
An ongoing strand of programming on Mocha TV is music videos. The more independent, the more artistic endeavors in the music industry. We aim to work with mainly Los Angeles-based musicians and, and, and they uh, produce these incredible videos. A recent one was um, the uh, artists who are, who are DJs called Nguzu Nguzu, and they're actually based here in Los Angeles, and they're Asma and Daniel. The video is called Me Mecca, M-E-C-H-A, and it features a sort of crazy assemblage of, of uh, video footage, news footage, uh, anime, sort of video game kind of aesthetic. We were delighted when they we agreed to be, you know, to, to showcase and we partnered with them on this music video. Right now, one thing is clear. The world is at war.
I'm Casey Jane Ellison, and I'm an artist and comedian. Above Ground Animation is a animation series. Animation you're so used to seeing in, diff in s particular forums, and I realized that independent animators have access to c to use these programs in completely new ways and new visual ideas that people aren't used to seeing in the mainstream or in the art world. I really wanted to be a part of that community and also build that community and present it. One animation featured in Above Ground Animation was one by artist Lauren Gregory, who's an East Coast-based artist. She's a painter, and she uses the paint and the materials to breathe life into her animations. They're basically moving portraits and um, paintings. Ha, ha, ha. 